All right, we've just made it here to the Troy Museum. Look at that little tiny snail. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. I'm easily sidetracked. Uh, so we were waiting to catch the minibus, actually, at a stop that was near our um, Airbnb. And uh, we didn't catch the, the minibus from the city center. Instead, we opted to catch it at a point that our host said we could catch it from. And uh, I don't know if that was true or not, because... The driver definitely saw us and he did not stop. So what we did was we caught a cab and it was uh, like 103 lira. So I think that's like roughly $13 or something like that. Uh, so it was $13 to get here basically from the outskirts of Chinakale. Uh I thought it was reasonable. And the guy actually gave us his card to get back. Um, so that'd be cool. I can just hit him up on WhatsApp and he should come get us. But uh, there's a museum here. So to get into the museum, it was 50 on its own was it it was yeah 50 for the museum entrance um or you could do 80 lira and that was for the museum fee and the fee for the archaeological site and that came out to roughly uh for the two of us 160 lira and uh that was roughly around 20 dollars uh for the two of us to enter into the museum and then also the archaeological site i'm not sure i think it's a bit of a ways up so we might have to take a little short walk but uh we're gonna head into this museum. I don't plan on filming too much inside because uh, if you if you come here, the information that's inside, you, you know, you'll be walking around and you'll seeing it all. So it's kind of pointless for me to make a really long video just on uh, information that you can uh, view yourself upon entry. But I'm definitely gonna get some shots over here and we, we spend a little time, Rachel watched a documentary and she wanted to share a little information that she learned. So when we head over there, we'll uh, get to yakking and show you guys around. So before we head over to the archaeological site, we did bring some peanut butters and some cookies. We're going to sit here on this bench, actually, just surrounding the uh, museum itself is actually a pretty extensive um, garden. And it's really nice as you're going up the different layers inside, you can kind of look out the window at it. But uh, it's really nice, as I was saying, and occasionally you'll see a little bench. There's a couple here. And there's nobody here, so we can take off our masks and have lots of space and enjoy a real quick snack to give us a little bit of fuel for our walk over around here in the archaeological site. Well, it wasn't a terribly extensive walk over here, but uh, I'm going to sit down and cool off a bit. And while I was sitting here, I noticed this tree says Arizona here. It's kind of interesting. It's like a type of a pine tree or something, but it's certainly not a ponderosa like in Arizona. But uh, what were you telling me on the way over here? It was the how the story was initiated, oh, the story the, of Troy? the legend started. So the legend of the Trojan War is started with a wedding. It's the wedding of Achilles' parents. And all the gods are invited. Everyone's there except for Discord. Discord wasn't invited, obviously, because she likes to come in and mess things up. Well, she came in with a golden apple. And on the apple was um, inscribed for the fairest. And Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite were all there. And they all claimed that they were the fairest and they should get the apple. Uh, they wanted Zeus to, uh, to you know, say who was the fairest. And he was like, I'm not rightly, smartly so, said I'm not touching that one. Paris, why don't you decide? Paris is the son of King Priam. He's the prince of Troy. Uh, and all of the gods, Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite, promised Paris a different gift if they should choose him. Well, Paris ends up choosing Aphrodite as the fairest, and she promises him the most beautiful woman in the world. The most beautiful woman was Helen. Now, Helen was married to Menelaus. Menelaus was the king of Sparta. Uh, his brother was Agamemnon. So Paris uh, goes to Sparta, takes Helen back to Troy, and thus ignites uh, the war. Um, Menelaus gets Agamemnon, who was his brother, who was the king of the Mycenaeans. Um, and they basically just get all of Greece, which includes uh, Achilles and, and other great warriors, Odysseus and um, all of them anyways. <laughs> all the good warriors <laughs> yeah, of the all, time. all the good ones. And, uh, and so they take their thousand ships from Greece across Troy, which uh, would have, is known as Asia Minor. Uh, and they, they start the Trojan War, and it lasted for 10 years. Nice. I read a bit about that part about Discord at the in the museum. Mm. I'm sure there was a lot more of it. But as I panned around, I was just showing you, this is kind of like the main area after you enter in through the gate. And then it looks like this is just all the little offshoots. And then just there on this sign here is a directional arrow telling you which uh, points of interest are in which direction. So let's go check it out. So here's the first bit of the ruins that we've come upon. 
uh, like the museum, there's really nobody here. I think a like a mother and a daughter just went by us. Uh, just here on the signage below me says that this portion here was like a council chamber. But this would originally all been a big mound, right? Is that what you were yeah, saying? Yeah, so it was all covered in dirt and the mound was known as Hisar Lick. It looked like a like an Aztec pyramid or something kind yeah, of? Yeah, I mean, just, just a mound. That shape. It, have, it was all like farmland and um, it was thought to be the site of Troy just because of where it lies in between two rivers uh, and, and how it's kind of a hill overlooking a valley over there. Mm. Um, you can see the little valley through here. Right, and so there were many archaeologists kind of throughout history that thought this was the spot. Um, there was an archaeo British archaeologist, no, it was a British um, just enthusiast, Troy enthusiast, I guess. His rich name guy? Was, uh, I guess, presumably, his name was Calvert. And he bought this, uh, most of this land, and he did a lot of research in his own ex excavations. And um, But then there was a guy in the like mid-1800s, his name was Schliemann, he was a German-American millionaire. And he came and he thought this was Troy, he became kind of obsessed. He met Calvert, but basically he started his own excavations, but he wasn't an archaeologist. He wasn't professional in any way. And he really destroyed a lot of it and made it a lot harder for the future archaeologists to the actual professionals to come in and kind of make heads or tails of it. Um, he actually dug through, he's uh, credited for finding Priam's treasure. Priam was the king of Troy, uh, but he found it in the like second level which was 2500 bc there's actually nine or ten levels of troy the trojan war in the time of priam when he would have had his treasure was in like the sixth or seventh level so it, it, he just messed everything up um they even say they don't even know if the treasure that he claimed to find was actually from here because he was kind of just a shysty kind of scandalous person so it, he might have just pieced it together from other places and then said he found the treasure and and of course it was a a media you know hit and everyone mm -hmm. became obsessed it went viral yeah yeah it did and maybe he was more like a just a greedy guy who wanted to find gold and stuff like that right right well he yeah he made um you know his millions in by selling gunpowder in the crimean war it's a little side note so he was a war profiteer mm -hmm. um which is pretty awful as well um, but he made a lot of money in the gold rush as he well was, in California. He was more about the money, not uh, the right. history or anything. Right. Some nice uh, old writing there in this slab, which is pretty neat. But this signage here was saying that this was the uh, the south gate. And as I come over here back to where Rachel's standing, you can see how it uh, would have entered into the uh, other portion of the uh, city, I would call it here. Right, you can even see like the drainage down the center. It's pretty cool. Oh, nice. Under so, there, huh? Yeah, when Schliemann excavate, excavated, excuse me, all of this, um, they were, there was um, some kind of clapback from the archaeological community because the area was so small and Troy was, uh, according to Homer, it was such a huge city. Um, and so for a long time, really like another century, until technology was able to advance, uh, were they able to actually discover the true size of it and there's I, I don't know how far it is out i apologize but there's actually a huge trench that goes all around uh, the city that they were able to find with a uh, magnetic imaging but they weren't able to do that until like the 1980s so really it was up in the air whether this was actually troy or not now current day uh, it is um everyone agrees this was most actually academics the site. believe right Right, this was indeed the side of Troy. Check out these birdhouses. I don't know, this looks like an oak, I'm guessing. Kind of neat little pile of uh, birdhouses there. But check out this little theater here. Just walking along a little bit more, there was actually a couple dudes repairing these uh, board walkways. Probably the perfect time to do it while there's not a lot of people here. So earlier I was telling you how the legend of the Trojan War started, but um, if we think more logically about how it actually started, if you look at a map where Troy sits, it would have been um, the direct path from getting to the Mediterranean Sea, the Aegean Sea, into the Black Sea. So really it stood at the center of a trade route, um, and they found off of the Aegean coast, they found a bunch of ships uh, that had... Um, you know, a bunch of trade from Egypt and all sorts of artifacts from just all these different parts. So they knew it's a, a main trade route. And on these ships, they also found um, copper and tin. And the uh, the equation for making bronze is nine or 
whoever you ask, nine or 10 parts copper to one part tin. And if you control the trade route to get bronze in the Bronze Age, uh, you would have been the most powerful city. So why wouldn't Greece want to come sack the most powerful city? That's a bit more logical than a pretty woman. <laughs> There's a little bit of side uh, imagery here as we walk along. You can see these old like footpaths too, and some of it kind of looks like it went up into that, uh, more into the uh, theater and like things we passed along with. They must have built this new um, trail system to kind of help from the erosion and uh, help to prolong the sites here. But here's just like a little bit of this little area here. You can see the different layers and stuff as you go. Right, and this place has been a tourist destination since the time of Homer. Um, so people would have been coming here because his stories were so famous and the story of the Trojan War was so famous that people would have, through all, out, all throughout antiquity, would have come here. In fact, they say uh, Xerxes stopped here, uh, Alexander the Great stopped here. They say he even stopped at the uh, temple to Achilles and took some of his armor and he wore Achilles' armor when he went to go fight the Persians. Hmm. It's really neat and they portray it actually in the museum over there uh, that uh, the water just would have been right here, the Mediterranean, right? Right. Portion of the Mediterranean. Well, the Aegean. The Aegean, yeah. which is a portion of the Mediterranean. And uh, so if you look, this is all just farmland because the scenery has changed so drastically that you have to go uh, kilometers to reach the uh, sea. And it's pretty neat how, uh, if you think these guys launched all these ships from here to go fight in this classic uh, tale that you hear about, but there's certainly no way for that to happen nowadays. Now here's a part of that path I was saying. There's uh, all these old pathways that you can see, but they're all restricted now, and uh, only certain things are available uh, to access with the new planks. Or maybe it's uh, the season or the fact that there is uh, such a restriction right now that They've really just limited everything because there's only so many people working here. Quite a neat little area here. I wonder if these are like wells or something. You can see some of these big uh, storage vases that they would bury underground and store like olive oil or wine or things of that nature. I just saw one over here. Maybe all of these are capped, but these end ones, you can see the tops are just uh, exposed and they've got stones on the top of them. And then maybe these are all... Uh, submerged and capped here. According to that signage there, this would have been uh, Troy 6, which would have been uh, where the actual Trojan War took place because of the amount of weaponry that they found and the level of destruction that they found here. And this is actually outside the citadel, so this would have been like the lower the lower town where the, they would have uh, been outside it, sieging it, the Greeks would have been. This level would have been that particular level that was... Mm -hmm nice mm -hmm. during that uh, those stories in that war so i was just ranting about how the the sea would have just been right here before but you can see as we walk along there's all kinds of uh shells this is really neat how it uh has all these different little paths you can follow through here rachel's the information gatherer i'm the explorer so we both get a little something out of it i think what do you think? Were those like wells or something there? I'm trying to read for sure. I, I don't know what else they could have been, but I'm trying to get some facts about it. Oh, look, there's other people. We're not the only ones here. Okay. Check out this leaf. It has like, I don't know, some type of, uh, I don't know, some type of fungus or some type of bugs, a larva. Interesting. There's some more shells actually in these different layers. And uh, as we were walking, we thought maybe we found a piece of uh, pottery. Look at, check it out. Maybe. Oh no. It certainly a, could see. be. Huh, if, especially if all these sides are washing away after the rings and then like all this stuff's going down here. Right, because imagine what is underneath this mound right here. Right, for sure. The signage back here was saying that, uh, we were trying to read it and see what that was. We never did figure it out, but it was saying that, uh, or at least we we believe that what it was referring to was this was a, a sacrificial pit, huh? Yeah. It's a trip. Rest in peace, whomever. 
right? It was uh, it was definitely something that they did in those times. Um, in fact, they don't they don't really talk about it in the Iliad or the Odyssey, but. It is said that Agamemnon's daughter was sacrificed because when they were bringing the ships over, the wind just stopped. So Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter uh, and the winds picked up and they were able to continue their way on to Troy, uh, which is actually the undoing of Agamemnon. Even though he was Greek and he won uh, the Trojan War, he came back to his wife and she actually slaughtered him because she was so pissed that he killed her daughter. Damn straight. Mm-hmm. Classic misunderstandings. So Homer is the reason we all know about the Trojan War. Um, he was uh, a bard, basically. He was a poet, a singer, and he would go and he would perform in the theaters or he would perform at parties of the aristocrats. And he would sing the songs of the Iliad was the first one and the Odyssey was the second one. The Iliad really chronicles the... The, tro the last four or five days or so of the Trojan War. And then the Odyssey uh, chronicles basically what happens to everyone at the end of the war and how uh, everyone gets back and what happens to them. You said uh, it chronicled the what? The last four or five days of the Trojan days War. Days of, I see. And uh, now Homer, they, it said that he was blind um, and that he was illiterate, but m not really anything else is known. Um, in the Odyssey, they do... He does mention a blind bard, so maybe that's where they get that information from. Uh, and they say he was illiterate, but most people at the time were. And in fact, uh, it is because of him and his stories that we even have uh, the Western language. The Iliad and the Odyssey were the first works of Western literature ever. And they were, uh, basically, they were liked so much that a, a Phoenician, I believe, a Phoenician scribe, took his alphabet, put vowels in there, and created the Greek alphabet. So that's why those stories in Homer are so, so important. Because if you would have, um, you know, imagine going to school, you know, 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, you would have learned the Iliad and the Odyssey because they were, they were all the works of literature that you had. They're like the first textbooks. Right, right. I mean, they, they I don't know, they, they weren't necessarily used as education uh -huh. or maybe maybe they would have been maybe they weren't taken as facts back then i don't i don't really know but i do find it very interesting that because of an entertainer we have uh, really what they see as the start of the western civilization i was kind of guessing when we were talking about where the water would have been but this shows that it would have just been right here in this valley where all this farming is so we weren't too far off we were just like right, right around down there when I was saying that. So if I zoom out from here, you can see where the sea is now. I don't know if you can really pick it up. Just maybe just a little tiny bit. Let's see if I can... Just there is the sea, how far out it's gone. The sea levels have uh, fallen so much that it's, like I said, a few miles and kilometers out. The infamous Troy tree squirrel. Check out this image. It's kind of uh, what they assumed this uh, road here would have looked like and entered up into the city. It was saying that they believed that this was the East Gate. And earlier, Rachel, you were saying something about Priam's treasure or something, weren't you? Yeah, so Schliemann said he found Priam's treasure, and according to the sign, they, they found it right here to the left of, yeah. of the gate. Maybe down in here or something. Yeah, I, maybe. I, I don't know, but um, we don't even know if it is Priam's treasure. Um, but you can So-called Priam's treasure. Right, right. It, it's just a shame, too, because you can really see how he's kind of just tore through everything. Oh, uh, yeah. He, had he taken his time and didn't come through with bulldozers and jackhammers. Just dug and, straight down, right. huh? Not that he used those equipment. I was just being sarcastic. But the equivalent those. of the time. <laughs> right, 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 right. Slaves. I'm just kidding. Right. Had, had he used the proper technique, he probably would have had a lot more information than what we do now. All right, this thing over here is... So this was the, the shaft of a well, it looks like. Pretty neat. Mm-hmm. But uh, heading back towards, uh, in the very beginning, I was saying at that south wall, I was kind of zooming in. It looks like uh, 
heading more towards the center of whatever this was, but it looks like terracotta bricks I keep kind of catching in the background. It's a really neat, uh, I don't know what even to call it right here. Just like a bunch of different layers, like a canal almost type. Right, I don't know why this area would have been significant and in this valley, but it's cool the way they labeled it. You can see all of the different layers. Right. It's got two there. It doesn't have all of them, but you can see even up there, it goes up to nine. That freaking squirrel's getting down. Is that cute? Check out this gnarly fig tree. It doesn't look like it's ever been trimmed back. I've never seen one so just wild like this. Here goes a little fig right here. A little tiny one, huh? Yeah, there's an image right here of this uh, valley, or at least this big canal, or I don't even know what you would call right. it. I guess a, a trench. This is where... Yeah, oh look, there's some uh, sheeps there. Nice. That's so cool. Where's then, the shepherd? Huh. They say that this is where Schliemann came through with his trench, and he just had them... Uh, dig down to bedrock and 40 meters wide with basically just disregard for everything else. So this area with the uh, red like terracotta colored type bricks is actually uh, these are a modern reconstruction and underneath this is the portion uh, it was titling it like a mega run or something like that but it would have been like a, like a structure I guess like that one there you think? I guess so. I don't know if it was like a house or a meeting place or what it was or what. I don't know what a megaron is. But this portion, they like I was saying, they actually built. Uh, they put some modern um, bricks over the top of it because uh, they didn't discover that till like ninety nine, ninety eight, ninety nine, and then they wanted to preserve it, so they kind of uh, did their best to like mimic the bricks that would have been used, and then they put this nice uh, modern shade over the top of it to protect it it's kind of neat you'll see it as you enter in it's kind of the center of all this it seems there's a uh, really neat viewpoint over here we're going to head up and check out there goes all the sheep the herder just went by this is up on that little viewing platform i was talking about it's not the uh, grandest view from up here but it gives you a bit of the uh, top view of some of these structural walls the bases anyway i'd say and then kind of back towards where we were just over there. It's really neat. Uh, it looks like some type of uh, tree farm over here. It's really neat seeing all the uh, valley around here and then the sea back out there like I was showing earlier. But just these different layers are just insane. Like, look how far down that goes. Well, it looks like we've almost come full circle. There's a neat little uh, path that looks like it heads down through some of these old walls here. Walk around the corner and see, see how it looks as we drop through. Oh, there's another one of those big bases that was submerged. That is so cool. It's like they just found so much stuff that they were like, eh, we don't need to take all of it. Let's huh. just leave it. Just leave that there. Pretty neat here. One of the fuller walls here, pretty trip. You see uh, tool markings on some of the stuff. We noticed as we were going along, there's a bunch of ends on a lot of these bricks. Not sure what that's all about, but pretty trip. It's a different wall, different uh, tool markings on most of this brick. I don't know how much of this is modern and how much of this is uh, old. Some of that stuff looks kind of modern, huh? Right, but some of the signs we were reading saying that the modern brick was from 300 BC. So even though uh, some of it's modern, it's still not that modern. modern. Check out these uh, bricks over here. They're really tight. So these are pretty uh, well fit together, these pieces here. We're going to so go. I was totally watching this one documentary, and he showed this wall. Oh, really? Yeah, and what he showed was... Uh, to make it more earthquake resistant, what they did, see how this... Slopes? Yeah, they, they, they did that on purpose so that the walls would fall into each other. Instead of apart. The quake and become more stable. Nice. Than fall apart. I'm so glad I saw that. Thanks to whatever documentary that guy. Oh yeah, you can see it now that I've stepped back a little bit better. 
So here's a nice view of basically a majority of what we just saw from this platform up here. We're a little limited on time now. A gentleman actually just came around and said uh, that they're going to be closing in roughly 30 minutes. There's a little uh, Trojan horse statue over here. Actually, we want to go back over here and cover a little bit about. But uh, pan figured I'd pan back around and show you. Here's the infamous Trojan horse. Um, so this is really cool because it looks like you could at one point go up in there. And I'm sure the original or, you know, what was supposed to be the original, I don't think it was actually real, but I wouldn't have had windows or anything like that. Oh, that would have been a dead giveaway. <laughs> right. But it was built by the Greeks um, because the uh, Achilles had just died. They'd been battling for 10 years. I won't go into any of the other details because if you want it, you got to read the Iliad and the Odyssey yourself. Uh, but basically, the Greeks hide in here, and then they get in their ships, and most of them sail away. Um, the, the Trojans see this. Uh, they uh, Troy was a city of Athena, and Athena is represented by the horse. And so they built them a horse, and they thought it was a gift. It, in those times, it was very, very common to leave gifts. If people even just showed up out of your house out of the blue, you were expected to give them a nice gift. Um, so they left them a gift of the horse. All of the Trojans thought they'd won. They all started partying. They all got drunk. And then in the middle of the night, the Greeks pour out, um, just kill everyone, burn the city to the ground. Um, and that is how the Greeks won the Trojan War. So I think that's probably going to conclude our tour of the ancient city of uh, Troy here. Uh, thank you guys for coming along. We appreciate it. Uh, yes, and definitely come check it out yourself. It's, yeah, it's absolutely neat. worth the effort to get here. It's worth the price to get in. It is so cool. Yeah, it's, it was a fair price to get in. It was a fair price to get here from Tanakhale. Yeah. I think they yeah. even do like day trips from uh, Istanbul, which probably be a, a little bit more technical and costly, but you can do it. But uh, yeah, thank you guys, like I said, for coming along and stay safe out there and stay sane.